Okay, Tesla, it's your turn. Are you ready? No, Newton, it's not your turn yet. Okay, draw a card, Tesla. Just one card. Okay, good job. What'd you get? Oh, you got a blue. Okay, let's move you to blue. There you go. Yeah, blue, that's right. Okay, now Papa's gonna finally win because I just need to draw one card, right? Just one? All right, here we go. Did you, did you rig the deck, Newton? Did you do this? You gave me the peppermint card? You cheated! You cheated again, didn't you? <laughs> Babies always cheat. Zoom in on. Newton. <laughs> All right, everyone. Uh, welcome back to EC Twenty Thousand Two. Uh, today we're doing lecture 35 and we're covering chapter 37, which is just telling us that everything we've learned up to this point is one big lie, including the fact that um, this actually recorded the first time. So if I seem grumpy, it's because this is the second time I've recorded a lecture and the second time this has happened uh, where it's gotten deleted. So woohoo. All right. So why is everything that we've been told so far a lie? Well, because inductors and capacitors really don't behave like um, the ideal versions that we've been taught so far. They actually have um, individual intricacies to them that cause them to have some kind of resistance values in, in different regions of that element. And they also have their own little uh, inductances and capacitances within themselves, respectively. Um, so, you know, it really just depends on how deep you want to dig to find uh, the true behavior or a perfect model of the system. And fun fact, uh, there is no perfect model. And all models are wrong. It's just some are a little bit more useful than others in certain situations. Um, when analyzing different frequency effects, sometimes we want to talk about some of these non-ideal uh, cases. So this is the lie that we've told ourselves to sleep at night. Okay. It's that we have this inductor from here to here is the voltage across that inductor. And there's some current going through that inductor and the equation that governs it. You know, we pull this from the continuity equations. This is the relationship between that uh, current and that voltage. So a very useful, very nice equation, but it is one big fat lie. Um, the main issue here is there's just a lot of wire, okay? There's just a ton of wire in this in the system, okay? Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of wire. So with that, we have some kind of resistance in line with our uh, inductor, okay? And we're going to see this again when we get to the transmission line stuff a little bit, um, that lots of wire equals, yeah, there's some resistance on there, Um and really, if you think about it, it depends on the length of the wire and everything else. So, um, but we still want to treat this as kind of its own little element. So we don't want to get into, you know, completely just dealing with the physics of the, the thing. Um, but there are a couple other physical considerations we have to have, which is that we have this uh, core um, that can pick up that magnetic field and store energy for us. Well, it's not a perfect transfer every time, right? So we have a little bit of loss from that. Um, and then we also have some capacitance between all of our different windings. And although it's very minimal uh, for the windings between, you know, two individual wires, this adds up. And so we have a little bit of capacitance that occurs from there. Um, for now, we're going to ignore this until we get to the gigahertz range. And we're not going to really do too much in the high frequency uh, realm, but we are going to try to build a slightly more realistic model of our of our elements and our system and how we transmit uh, signals across long distances so that when you know in the future when you get to this stuff too um, number one it's not the first time you've seen it and number two um, we have a better um, model in place for us to be able to handle um, certain high frequency characteristics okay so I don't care how you want to pronounce this, gigahertz or gigahertz, either is fine. Uh, I got Doc Brown here to, you know, if you want to do uh, gigahertz. All right, so a little side note, 
Uh, resistors, by the way, also aren't really constant for, at all frequencies, or for all frequencies. Um, they also are going to vary quite a bit depending on the frequency that you put in. And there's other physical properties that, that can affect them too. Um, temperature is one, um, you know, the, the, there's just, there's a lot of stuff. <laughs> okay, so there's a lot of physical phenomenons that we want to take care of. For right now, though, we're not going to really touch that um, issues with the resistors there. But we need to figure out if this is the ideal version of our inductor, really, what do we care about? Well, um, we, we actually just care about um, this non-ideal version of it. Because really, the wire is the biggest driver of this. Um, so, yeah. And similarly, we have a, a similar model for the capacitor where it has this extra inductor in there uh, from the lead wires and some resistance coming in. And then that energy storage is not 100% efficient and there's some leakage. Um, and that leakage is actually the biggest driver of our model here. And so that's what we're going to account for in this lecture is we're going to be looking at the capacitance and the parallel resistance for that capacitor. So the first thing you might notice here is that our quote unquote ideal, non-ideal model, <laughs> if you want to think about it that way, it's our, our semi non-ideal model. This guy has two elements in parallel. And this guy has uh, two elements in series. And so when we look back at our nice, beautiful um, RLC circuits where we had series RLC and parallel RLC, immediately we're going to run into a contradiction, right? Because we have um, either all the elements are in series or all the elements are in parallel. And so if both of these models are used, we're not going to quite have that anymore. And the circuit's going to get very, very complicated very quickly. So we need to develop some tools here because in this one, we have uh, the standard parallel case. Well, this is great and all until we look at the uh, little resistance attached to our inductor. And by the way, we're going to refer to this in, in this setup here, not as RS anymore because it's not in series with the rest of the circuit but rather as our little RL because it's attached to that uh, inductor. And that's going to come in handy for us because it's a little bit better notation. Similarly for the uh, capacitor here, we're going to do the same thing. So the capacitor and its little resistance are in parallel with each other, and that's fine. So problem inductor. And then this one has a problem with the capacitor. Okay. So what can we do? Um... Well, not much, right? We don't really have any other tools at this time to be able to deal with uh, making this more simple. So we can either try to solve the circuit as is and make some kind of approximation, or we can make it look like a totally parallel or totally series. I still haven't figured out if there's a shorthand <laughs> for series. Um, so just work with my big sigma there, I guess. I don't know what else to do for it. Um, but there's a way that we can convert, if there was a way we could convert, from a setup like this, right, to something like this, then we'd be in business, right? And we'd need to go back and forth between these two, right? It'd need to be a one-to-one -one mapping. So is there a way we could do this? And similarly, we want to do the same thing for the capacitor, too. Well, yes, and actually the best way or the best vehicle for doing this is to look at things from the perspective of, once again, the frequency domain. We're looking at things from the impedance perspective and admittance perspective. Okay, so we need to develop some tools first before we can address this conversion for both our inductor and our capacitor, okay? So the first tool that we're going to develop is what we call the quality factor of a circuit element, okay? And this quality factor effectively is just the reactance over the resistance, where I define my R and my X as different components, the real and imaginary components of my impedance, when the input is equal to uh, J omega here. And I should probably specify that, actually, for the definition of Z here, uh, just to make this a little bit more clear. Okay? And note that we're normally working off of the J omega axis, so this is really no big deal. Um, all right, so from here, what, what can we do? Well, 
Um, for the inductor, as it turns out, this is the equation for the quality factor, and for the capacitor, this is the equation for the quality factor. Both of these are based off of that impedance. Now, it's actually not too bad to derive these. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and work through this a little bit. What's the impedance of our model that we have here? So we have an inductor and then a, oops, inductor and then a resistance in series with each other. And if I'm looking at the impedance of this uh, whole thing put together, really I just add these two things together, right? This is R and this is equal to, uh, and this guy here is just equal to uh, J omega L sub S, okay? And we're gonna call it L sub S because it's in series with that other resistor, okay? And what I do is I just add these guys together, J omega L S is the, let me write it up here actually. So Z J omega is equal to R S, R sub S plus J, and I'm gonna leave the J on the outside just to keep things a little bit clear and cleaner omega L sub S, okay? Now, when I look at this, I basically break this thing in half and I take the ratio of the two parts. The, the top part for the Q factor is going to be equal to this omega L S. So Q of L, or sorry, of Z L, J omega, is equal to the real part, or I'm sorry, the imaginary part, omega L S, and then I divide by the resistance which is exactly what we have over here, okay? Pretty easy stuff. All right, well, if that was easy, it should be no uh, no difficult matter to just deal with the capacitor part, right? Well, kind of. It's, <laughs> it's not as much fun. All right, so let's take a look here. I have these two, and what I'm interested in is the impedance, right, to a certain extent. Well, I could look at it from the perspective of the admittance and then deal with it from there, um, if you want to look at it from the perspective of uh, impedance, we can do that as well. So let's go ahead and write a couple things that we know first off. Um, this is going to be equal to the uh, Z in parallel, R in parallel, oops, R in parallel, okay? And so we know that the admittance here for our capacitor is equal to 1 over uh, RP plus J omega CP, right? You add add things that are in parallel for the admittance, you add things that are in series for the overall uh, impedance. Okay, so from here, we could just take, um, take this and divide it over um, by one, right, to get ZC. So this is one over one over RP plus J omega CP. Oof, well, okay, that's a little bit of a mess. Um, what can we do from there? Well, this is, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, we just multiply top and bottom by RP to get us going. But, oh, wait a minute. We can't do that. We've got this J down in the denominator, right? And what we really need is we need something of this form. Hmm. Okay, so in order to get rid of that J in the denominator, we use the complex conjugate in order to uh, simplify this expression. So ZC should be equal to, I'm going to go ahead and throw that RP up top to get rid of it. So this is RP over one plus J omega CP RP. That'll make this a little bit easier to deal with. And then when I multiply top and bottom by the complex conjugate, then I end up with the following. I end up with one minus J omega CP RP all over one plus, now everything's gonna be squared, right? Squared squared, squared, and that j goes away because the j squared becomes a negative one. And this is really just a difference of squares formula, but it's not a difference of squares. If I have a negative one factor stuffed in there, and this is the magic of the complex conjugate, just adds our two pieces together. It's also, by the way, how you calculate that um, you can use this to get the magnitude, right? Okay, so from here, what do we do? Well, um, it's a little bit of a mess, but it's actually much, much easier for us to work with. Why is that? Well, that's because ZC can now be broken up into two parts. The first part being this, and then a minus J uh, omega CP 
RP, and we're multiplying that RP through, right? So that's going to be RP squared plus omega squared CP squared RP squared. And this just looks like a mess. But we actually can uh, handle it pretty nicely because we're taking, remember, the ratio of this and this with this guy on top and this guy on bottom, all right? So when I do that, I just divide and I end up with the following. I have omega CP RP squared over one plus omega squared CP squared RP squared over RP divided by one plus omega squared CP squared RP squared. And these two guys are gonna cancel out for me politely and this and this will cancel out leaving me with just omega CP RP, which is exactly what we had um, for the Q factor here, right? And note here that taking the ratio of these two things is exactly what the Q factor is um, for the capacitor at J omega. All right, so that's how we found our quality factor. Now, these may seem kind of superfluous at the moment, but I assure you that they will come in very handy for us uh, moving forward because it helps simplify uh, some of these ratios and, and expressions that we're dealing with. All right, a quick reminder, as a side note, this recently happened to us during office hours. I know this is going to be way late, but, you know, better late than never. And, uh, you know, if it happens again, no big deal. But um, when, when you're doing the parallel operator for more than two elements, uh, make sure that you take all the, uh, the dual combinations of A, B, and C here in the denominator. Um, this is the form that is most easy easy to remember, um, but recently I made an error where I, where I did, uh, you know, something, something to the effect of this, um, forgetting to have those other coefficients in there. So um, don't do that. Be smart. Use the correct formula. Anyways, that's, a, that's your PSA for today, your public service announcement. All right, now back to the show. Okay, so, so what? Uh, big deal. You need an omega, right, to assess what the Q factor even is. And if I don't have an omega, generally speaking, the thing that I use is this omega naught, which is just 1 over um, the square root of LC. Uh, and that's for certain systems and everything, so it's kind of a mess, right? What the heck are we going to do here? Well, we're going to finally develop that conversion first, and then we're going to worry about how to deal with um, our different frequencies and everything else here after the fact. Okay, so let's take a look here. Let's, uh, let's start from um, this impedance here, which is defined by some reactive element and its counterpart um, resistance that's been transformed into an impedance. Okay, so if I look at the equation here this is pretty straightforward my uh my impedance is as we said before um that resistance that's in series with the um with j times that reactance or i'm sorry the uh, the reactive uh element impedance okay so if i look at its counterpart if there were some other version of it in another alternate reality that looked like this then certain things would have to be true. First of all, in this new way of seeing the problem, or new way of seeing that element, the rules still have to hold, right? The admittance into the system would have to be equal to um, the sum of GP and BP, where BP is now our reactive element, okay? And GP is just kind of sitting there as that uh, constant, in there okay now we also know that if these two things are equivalent to one another then they should have the same input impedance and admittances right and the equation relating those two quantities is z is equal to 1 over y and therefore we we can say with confidence that if such a system or such a representation of our series existed in a parallel form then it would have to follow that Rs plus Jxs is equal to the reciprocal of our admittance, okay? And in order to simplify that, because we're going to need to deal with this, 
Uh, we're going to multiply again by the complex conjugate here so that we can get a form that breaks apart nicely into a real part and an imaginary part, right? And we'll do that on the next page here. So breaking this apart, we have a real part and an imaginary part. And therefore, I can look here and say, well, this part is real, so it much, must match up. It must be equal to the real part over here. And I know this is imaginary, so it must match up with the uh, imaginary part over here, right? So similarly, we can do the same thing going the other direction. So if we started off with, if we started off with this system and we said, okay, we need to transform it or rather convert it into uh, that Z or the parallel perspective, then I can use the Z value of that, par excuse me. If we went from the parallel perspective to the series perspective, we would need to do this same operation, but backwards, okay? And so that's what we get when we look here. This has got to be equal to the reciprocal of that input impedance for the quote-unquote new version of our element. And we do the same trick we did before, except now um, we are, uh, we're multiplying top and bottom by the complex conjugate that's associated with um, this guy here. Whoops. This guy here. And when we do that, um, what we end up with is, again, a real part and an imaginary part. And so GP, the real part here, must be equal to this real part. And BP here must be equal to this imaginary part. And so now we have, have four equations, okay? These are like the four horsemen of the uh, <laughs> non-ideal non -ideal apocalypse, okay? <laughs> All right, so it's a non-ideal apocalypse. I, I don't know. All right, well, anyways... What can we do with these? Well, in principle, we have a simple approach for this, right? Which is, when we're thinking about how to form this thing, uh, maybe I better stop here, okay. Okay, so now we're going to actually, in practice, apply this kind of, uh, these equations here to solve for our hypothetical values of RP and LP in this converted model that we're trying to build. Okay, and we're gonna go this direction um, for the inductor, and we'll go this direction for the capacitor, right? Because we start in a parallel world for the capacitor that makes sense that we're familiar with, and then we wanna uh, be able to generate something that looks like a series. Okay, so first, the inductor, going this way. Now our target, where we're trying to go here is we're trying to make up some kind of equivalent inductance and resistance. So right out of the gate, we need to recognize that this is coming from this model that we just made, right? This GP for an admittance here and this BP for a reactive element here. We're measuring the... Uh, the system here. And in this case, y is equal to, and more specifically, y at j omega, uh, is equal to gp plus j bp. Well, in order for this to be true, the admittance um, would have to be, uh, in terms of these variables, would have to be equivalent to, let's write this over here, one over RP, right, for that, that constant. And then we also have sort of a funny thing happening here. Um, what's the admittance of this system? If we just had the variables running around um, just having a good time. Well, it would be one over uh, SL, right, you recall? Well, S in this case is just a J omega, right? So this just becomes J omega. And then we get to the form that you have in the book. We can derive um, based on... Uh, the fact that this is the only imaginary part, 
right? And this is a real part. Uh, that we get two equations, gp is equal to 1 over rp, and similarly, jbp is equal to 1 over j omega l, and we'll just cancel out those j's and we'll get something a little bit nicer. We get bp is equal to minus 1 over omega l, okay? But we just did a bunch of hard work using our four horsemen. All right, we have the following equation. We know that BP is equivalent to two different expressions. We have this one, and we have this guy here. So let's go ahead and pop that in. Now, before we do that, though, let's go ahead and define some other things. So if I look at this system from the same perspective, I know that my reactive element here is XS and RS here for the constant. Looking at the impedance of this system, it's very easy. Uh, we just know that Z j omega is equal to, well, just rs plus j ls, right? And the equivalence here would be that, well, rs is <clears throat> rs, and uh, ls here is equal to xs, or omega, excuse me, omega ls. So xs here is equal to omega ls, right? That should be pretty clear, um, because that's how we calculate the uh, the, the impedances for a, an inductor, or how we did it back in the impedance and emittance section, okay? So, knowing that, and moving forward, we have the equation we just solved is equal to this guy. Now, with our terms all defined, we can write this as minus xs over xs squared plus rs squared, which is equal to minus omega ls and note here that this is not just an l but an lp because this is our parallel model this is our target model so we need to make sure we carry that along for the ride or we're going to be very very sad at the end of the day okay um then an, another omega squared ls squared down here plus an rs squared just stays okay now we do a little bit of algebra algebraic Okay, and we get something that looks like uh, the following. We isolate uh, LP on one side of the equation. We just take the reciprocal over here, right? And the omegas are going to stack up with each other, and the minus signs are going to cancel out. Uh, we're going to end up with the following. LP is equal to RS squared plus omega ls, and we'll do quantity squared here just to keep it simple, over omega squared ls. Noting here um, that the omega squareds from this one is the combination of this omega and this omega uh, down in the denominator now. Okay, so simplifying this a little bit further, we end up with uh, lp is equal to, by pulling out uh, all the LS stuff a little bit here. And now using that Q factor that we knew and loved so much, let's go back to that real quick. So our Q factor for L was equal to omega L over RS. So if I find a place where this exists in my equation, I can actually replace it with that Q factor. So let's see what we can do. Um, if I pull out an LS out front here, then I'm left with what? I'm left with the sum of RS squared over omega squared LS squared. Hey, that's our Q factor, isn't it? That's pretty handy. Well, in a way, it's our Q factor, but it's upside down, right? Let's just go ahead and, and rewrite this guy. So this is omega L over RS. So i got to find space here. Oops. Q, Z, L, J, Omega was equal to uh, Omega, L, S over R, S, okay? So if we have that expression here, this is just 1 over Q squared, right? And we'll see that in a second here. But we also have uh, the other part, which is this plus, breaking up this expression now, breaking up the numerator, 
Um, some stuff cancels here. We're just left with, I believe, one, because we factored out the LS out front here. So this actually becomes a very nice expression for us. This is just equal to um, LS times one over, and I'll put the other, I'm gonna switch these two just to write a nicer expression and match the book. Um, this over one plus one over Q Z L J omega, and this guy is squared, okay? And you don't really, you don't need the J omega here if you don't want, it's fine. We know that it's J omega. All right, so we can do the same thing for the capacitor. I'm actually gonna leave this as an exercise so I can keep this lecture short, short, short. Um, but it's the exact same process, and it's actually a really good uh, exercise for you guys to be able to do. Maybe it'll show up somewhere on an exam. It's kind of a simple thing. I don't know, but uh, we'll see. Not, not making any promises. So, yeah, there's kind of a simple thing here. Uh, once you solve it, oh, we didn't even do our uh, resistance value here. We for totally forgot about that. Let me make another page. Okay. So in order to solve for uh, the resistance, RP, um, we can do a similar process here. I'm just going to write it out because I'm really lazy, especially after already having done this once. So there it is. That's going to be the equation for the new resistance. And as Q increases, right, this just basically becomes RP is equal to QZL squared rs and as q increases our other equation is going to become uh, just dependent on well basically the one there so lp just becomes ls as well so high q's mean that our inductors um, effectively go uh, to be equal to each other in both of these models and the resistance value effectively goes to zero as this guy increases the resistance value of the parallel case. That is to say, um, it just becomes, um, just becomes an, a, a, an inductor there. And then this becomes virtually zero, uh, over there. Okay. All right, now we can uh, move into the, con the capacitor here. We've already said this is what the answers are going to be. Okay, we have this one for the new CS and this one for the new RS. And then again, as Q gets very, very large, CS is equivalent to CP, which is something that we would hope for because if it's in an ideal case, those resistors shouldn't matter anymore. And effectively, um, what we have here is that RS in series goes to... Uh, being equal to, as this gets very, very large, just RP, so the two resistances are equivalent to each other. Um, I'm sorry, excuse me, not equivalent to each other. RS is equal to RP over a very, very large number, and so um, RS becomes very, very small, so this gets very, very small. And uh, RP gets very, very large, respectively, okay? So the ratio or the relationship between the two is RP is much, 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 much greater than RS. Okay? And that's kind of the, the long short of it. No pun intended. Because you're kind of short. Never mind. Okay, so if we don't know our initial non-ideal uh, parallel and series resistances for the capacitor and the inductor, respectively, we can use this sort of approximation where uh, we use that resonance frequency. But this only really works in, in high Q inductors. And the only reason that it does work is because we show that there's this sort of consistency going on. And um, that's, that's what is sort of the whole lichpin here, uh, is, uh, is having that high Q factor. If you don't have the high Q factor, yeah, this gets a little sketchier and sketchier um, as it diminishes, okay? But in general, high Q allows us to do this. And I'd say anything roughly on the order of 10 is, is you know, doable for this, and, and that's fine. 
we're just making approximations here. Okay, so now we're going to do an example where we have um, a couple of known things. We have a known Q factor for our inductor and our capacitor, and we need to find an approximate value for omega m, our bandwidth, and then our two, um, basically our two boundaries on, on where our pass band is, right? That's what omega L and omega H represent. Okay, and we're given a circuit that looks like the following. It's got um, an inductor here that's uh, 20 millihenries. We have a capacitor that's uh, 0.05 microfarads. And then we have a resistor here in, in the uh, series line, um, which we're going to convert anyway and do the Norton uh, equivalency. And the reason we're going to do that is because we want to put everything in parallel with each other at the end of the day. Now, starting off here, it all looks pretty good from the capacitor perspective. They're ready to rock and roll. The inductor is the problem child here. And so we need to convert our inductor over into our parallel model and hope that it's good enough to be able to work for us. And in fact, uh, since we're over 10 here, we're totally justified in doing this. We can just say that this is um, for um, QZL omega naught, that 40 is equal to uh, omega naught LS over RS. Recall that this was the uh, equation that we had for the quality factor here. Okay, so we know some bits of information about LS and RS already, or we have a relationship between the two, and knowing already what our inductance is, we should be in good shape. So we should be able to derive some good stuff here. Um, what is omega naught though? We can actually solve for omega naught in this system. Uh, we know that omega naught must be equal to 1 over the square root of LC, right? So with that in mind, we have, let me get a new sheet of paper here. And we're going to copy this guy over so that this is a little bit, um, well, let's do everything. Let's just grab everything. And we'll paste that little bit right up top there. Okay, so 40, let's zoom in here. 40 is equal to omega naught uh, L over, and it's L in, uh, in series, right, over RS. And in this case, our RS is actually going to be represented by a different... Um, letter, I guess you could say, or a different uh, way of writing it. It's R, little rl, okay? Little rl. But as I was saying, uh, we actually know what omega naught is. Omega naught is going to be equal to the square root of lc, uh, 1 over the square root of lc. And that's just, you plug in those values, okay? Um, and what you end up with is, this is basically the square root of 10 to the ninth, which is equal to roughly 31.6 uh, kilorads per second, okay? And that's equal to omega naught. All right, so we're off to a good start here. And as a matter of fact, um, since we know omega naught here, we actually know omega m, right? So it's going to turn out that omega m, omega naught are roughly equivalent to each other. Uh, and so this is going to just be equal to 31.6 kiloradians per second as well, okay? So we've already solved a good chunk of the problem. Um, and we feel confident in making this sort of assumption that uh, omega naught and omega m are, are the same here, more or less. Um, all right, so let's see here. What else do we know? Well, we know that when we have a high Q, we can make a few other assumptions, right? We know that we can make the assumption that LS is going to be roughly equal to LP. So our new L, L, uh, LS, or I'm sorry, our new LP here is just going to be equal to uh, 20 millihenries. So that's going to be important, right? So if we put our, our um, inductor and its little resistance in parallel, um, that inductance is going to be just remain the same. Now, for our resistance, we know that for a high Q, that RP is equal to QZL times omega naught 
L. And conveniently here, we, we noted this on the last uh, page here. Oops. Right here. All right. So that's the case for the uh, for the parallel. And then with that in mind, we have this is going to be uh, 25.3 kilo ohms. It's actually pretty big, and it's not super large, but it it's kind of in that Goldilocks zone. So if you look here at our at our uh, load and this uh, our big RS, um, it's in the same ballpark as these guys. So this is definitely going to be playing a role for us here. All right. Uh, we don't need to convert the capacitor, but we do need to solve for RC a little bit here. So how do we solve for RC? Um, well, RC is actually just equal to, by the same kind of equation that we used here, QZC, and then we divide that by omega naught C. And so this gives us a capacitance, or excuse me, a resistance for the capacitor equal to uh, 62, uh, 63.2 uh, kilo ohms, okay? So notice something interesting here. This, this is much bigger than uh, this guy. Why is that? And these are both parallel now in this case. This is a new parallel version of that same resistance that we had. And we could actually call this, uh, if you wanted to, RL prime, right? Or or RL sub P, if you wanted to say it in parallel, however you want to do it, whatever floats your boat there. Um, but back to my point, what is, why, why, are, why is this resistance bigger than this resistance in parallel? Well, that's because if you think about it, what would be the ideal resistance? Well, the ideal resistance would be for this resistance to go to infinity i.e. we just completely uh, open up that circuit. There's no, there's no way to actually let current through there, right? The capacitor is behaving perfectly. And quite frankly, that would make our inductor behave perfectly as well because the new parallel resistance would go to uh, infinity as well. And so all, you know, there wouldn't be any current or anything flowing through there. Um, just be completely awash. So, all right, well, that's interesting. But why is one bigger than the other? Well, it comes down to this Q factor, once again. So which one has the higher Q factor? Well, the capacitor does. The capacitor has a Q factor that's eh, maybe a little over twice the Q factor of the inductor. And what do you know, uh, if ideally this goes off to infinity uh, for both of these, then if one is better than the other, then it should be larger. And in fact, the resistance here is a little over twice what this one is. So that's actually pretty cool. It all kind of makes sense for us here. All right, well, now we can draw a new version of this circuit, and we're going to use that Norton equivalent. Um, and so we have Vn of t, right? And then this guy's going to come down here for 40 kiliohms. And then we have our inductor. Let me just draw a line. Our inductor, which is uh, still 20 millihenries. Recall that we converted it. We did, we did due diligence. We did what we were supposed to do. This is a resistor. <laughs> Pretend with me here. 25.3 uh, kilo ohms here. And then our capacitor. Our capacitor is still 0 0.05 farads, and we still... Haven't really done much to modify that because it's still in the same configuration. We have uh, 63.2 uh, kiloohms, right, for that uh, capacitor resistance. And then finally, our load, we'll put it down here at the end, all by itself, uh, 10 kiloohms, all right? And then our V out is measured from this end over here. All right, so now we can just kind of collect all these pieces together, uh, our new is going to be equal to 40. And I'm actually going to leave the units off of this because this is going to drive me nuts. 40 in parallel with 25.3, in parallel with 63.2, in parallel with 10, which is equal to roughly, approximately, whatever, uh, 
5,545, you know, just doing that in my head or, you know, reading the book, whatever. <laughs> but anyways, uh, now we have a simple RLC circuit. Right? And we know how to solve these, but our new equivalent version is going to have L equal to 20. No surprise there. C equal to 0 0.05. Uh, and that's microfarads. And our total resistance, or the resistance that we throw in there in parallel, is just going to be equal to this. Okay? And from here, we can do all that great stuff we wanted to do with our circuit. And so now, we actually have all of those other things solved for us. We already did all the hard work in, earlier in the class to solve for things like omega m uh, for that. We solve for the bandwidth, we solve for omega L, we solve for omega H, and that Q factor of the band pass. Okay, different Q, different Q. All right, so let's do that. So let's do that. So we know that, uh, reiterating here, omega M is roughly equal to 31.6 kilorads per second. Uh, bandwidth is equal to 1 over RC for our parallel model. And uh, that's 3.6 uh, kilorads per second when we do the math. The omega L, actually, I want to do the Q factor first because that makes way more sense. You just take the ratio, right, of omega M and uh, the bandwidth. Pretty straightforward. So this is just equal to Q equal to omega M over bandwidth. That's equal to 8.78. .8. And so what kind of filter do we have here? Um, well, it's a, it's a pretty... I, I mean, it's not great, but it, it's decent. Uh, it's a decent quality factor, almost 10. Uh, 10, would, 10 or higher would be ideal, um, but eh, that's okay. We'll, we'll take 8.78. I'll take that all day long. Um, and then uh, notice here our bandwidth is uh, about a factor of 10 from here, so this should come as no surprise. Um, but, you know, we're looking at if this was, uh, if this was 10, right? Then this is just one and one on either side for our bandwidth. Okay. R give or take. Okay. We're, we're exaggerating here. So that's not too bad. Okay. So let's look at the actual, no kidding boundaries we have here for this. Um, this is roughly equal to omega M and notice there's, you know, there's some asymmetries and stuff going on with this and that's fine, but no big deal. because of our scaling uh, bandwidth over two, 33.4 kilorads per second. Okay, and that's it, that's the whole problem. You just pop those into those equations that we already had, we already had those equations, and you're good to go. All right, gang, well, that's gonna do it for this lecture. I hope it's super short, and uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, learning about non-ideal versions of everything and hearing that uh, everything I've taught you and everything everyone else has taught you up to this point has been a lie and we'll continue the lie uh, moving forward just little smaller lies okay from here forward okay I promise that it will get a little bit better <laughs> all right we'll see you next time we're gonna do a uh, transmission line and wave equation and uh, what I'd like for you guys to do well that was the original version I did oh well uh, what I'd like for you guys to do is for next time look at um, telegrapher's equation or telegrapher equations okay and that's going to be really helpful for you all um, for the next lecture because it can get kind of confusing seeing all this stuff for the first time and there's a lot of differential equations that we're going to be going over okay so look up something on like YouTube or whatever. Look up, uh, you know, Wikipedia. The Wikipedia article is not too bad. Uh, and just get a feel for it. And you can also look up the wave equation. Okay. If you want to get a good jump on that. Because basically where we're going uh, next time is we're going to take our continuity equations in effect. And we're going to develop the telegrapher equations, which give us the wave equation. Okay. And the... 
effectively what this is doing is this is just adding a, a z dimension and then this is just taking a derivative uh, of that with respect to z or t it depends on which which part you're looking at um but yeah that's pretty much it all right well we'll see you guys next time and we only have two more left so stick with it